Now, they've never been able to find evidence of Bible characters in archaeology. They never found Solomon's magnificent temple. You know, they never found the destructions of Jericho. And they looked hard. And they've never been able to find proof. So they think that all these Bible characters are just a myth. Now, David Roll, in a test of time, found some interesting information that identified a whole bunch of Bible characters in Egyptian correspondence. Okay? And with that, you get some interesting conclusions. And the most interesting one is this. Everybody knows King Solomon was the richest king on earth. He had 800 tons worth of gold shields for decorations. And that's just the gold shields. Gold goblets, gold chairs, gold toilets, gold taps. I mean, richest man on the planet. And after he died, five years later, Pharaoh Shishak invades and plunders the richest treasure in the world to become the richest man in the world. So, who was Shishak? The richest Pharaoh ever. Well, guess what? They misidentified him. Wrong guy. And Roll found the right guy. And then I have to now convince you because they call his idea a French theory. So, I got a little script here and I'm going to run over the timelines you'll recognize. The easiest timeline is the Israelite timeline because it's so precise. We got all the names all the way back. Okay? So now, you got the end of Israel itself in 722. In 800, you had Jehoahaz who was invaded by the Arameans and then delivered. And then you had uh, in 930 when King Solomon died, the split between the two uh, monarchies, Judah and Israel. And before that, you had 40 years of Solomon, and 40 years of David, and then 40 years of Saul. And then, 480 years after Solomon started his temple, 480 years before that, was when they had the exodus with Moses. And believe it or not, their numbers are really good. Now, 215 years before that, in 1662, that's when Jacob joined Joseph in Egypt during the famine, if you remember that from your Bible, but I'll go into that too. And then they had a sojourn, they stayed there 200 years, you know, living okay, until they got too many, then they got oppressed by the Pharaoh, then Moses left. So, this is an accurate timeline. You can trust it. Now, the Egyptian timeline, well, that's different. They don't have any firm dates pegged except the sacking of Thebes by the Assyrians in 664. So, here is the Egyptian timeline. Now, we're going to start way back when. And that was during the Middle Bronze Age. There was this huge catastrophe. And we'll guess what that was in a minute. Then they were invaded by foreigners. So catastrophe, then invasion, takeover, real easy, no resistance. Then, we don't know how long that was, that's called the second intermediary period. Now, the catastrophe happened to the 13th dynasty. Well, between this range here, you had the 14th, the 15th, the 16th, the 17th dynasties. Sometimes you had kings in the north and kings at the south at the same time. But then Amos, at the beginning of the 18th dynasty, reunited the two lands by kicking out the foreign Hyksos invaders. Now we have the New Kingdom, and this is the only block in Egyptian archaeology you can trust because it's stable, every one of them's got its years and its months and its days, and you can work all the way back 160 years, and you end up with... And Akhenaten happened 180 years later, and uh, you remember him, flower child, and he lost all the colonies, and you know, Egypt fell into disrepair, and he lost a lot of stuff. And then 80 years later, Ramses came along. You remember Ramses? Ramses the Great, he was a famous one, he's relevant to the story. And then, a few hundred years before that, you got Shoshank. And Shoshank's relevant because it sounds like Shushak. Okay, and then back here in 664, you have the sacking of Thebes. So, this is Egyptian chronology. Now, how does it fit to the Hebrew-Israeli chronology? 
Well, here's how they did it. They said, okay, let's check out Shoshank. Well, guess what? Shoshank made a campaign into Israel. He's got it on the walls. Big, big conquests, okay? And then down here, they pegged Ramses with the Ebers Scroll starting around 1280. And that's about it. Those are the two main, they got the Thebes, they got Shoshank, and they got Ramses they think they pegged somewhere. Now that is, now that is basically the chronology that they have connected us to. So, now, I'm going to now go into the Bible stuff. Well, let's start with the story of Joseph at the very beginning. Let me put this up here, so I don't have to touch it all the time. Oh, the story of Joseph. Okay, lots well, of story where he's sold by his brothers, ends up in Pharaoh's court, stable dynasty, and uh, within seven years he's made vizier and uh, predicts there's going to be seven years of good luck and seven years of bad luck and, and harvest and stuff because of the Nile coming up and all that. And Pharaoh makes him vizier and said, save up all the grain, let's get ready for this. And when the seven bad years hit, Guess what? Everybody's got to sell all their stuff. They've got to sell all their houses. They've got to put themselves into indenture to the Pharaoh to get food. And basically, he managed to take over, solidify everything through Joseph organizing the food. But that's when Joseph's brothers and Jacob end up coming back down. And he basically reacquaints you know, re himself with the family. And so in 1662, they start their sojourn in Egypt away from the famines in the Canaan. They stay there 200 years. And uh, then the Pharaoh, they say, who didn't know Joseph, uh, found there were too many, and he decided he was going to oppress them. And he put them to work under slavery and all that stuff. And then along came Moses. And everybody knows the story about Moses. Moses basically got them all to leave. Uh, after a bunch of whole catastrophes and plagues and all sorts of things that hit Egypt, they all got to leave. So Moses, uh, now what's interesting is when Joseph came down with uh, Jacob, he settled them in the district of Ramses. I mean, centuries before Pharaoh Ramses, okay? And then, this, and then the, um, because they were in the district of Ramses, the Pharaoh who oppressed them, started a store city called Ramses. Well, guess what? If the pharaoh of the oppression started a store city named Ramses in the district of Ramses, it must be Ramses. Everybody thought. <laughs> but he's hundreds of years later. It has nothing to do with the Exodus. But it makes it fantastic that they would say, you know, Ramses the Great is the pharaoh beaten by Moses. Makes it sound better, right? Couldn't have been Ramses the Great. Just couldn't be. So, just because they settled in the district of Ramses. So anyway, back now to, um, all right. So now after the Exodus, Joshua, well, he takes over the Canaan, burns a whole bunch of cities, and uh, then they settle down. And they settle down there during the period of judges in the Bible for about 400 years. Okay? And then after 400 years, you got... Saul, King Saul, who's appointed first king of Israel and Judah by, by the prophet, forget which one. And uh, anyway, the point is King Saul, and he has his adventures, like uh, the Philistines take his town, and he goes and takes it back, Jabesh. That's an interesting story. And then uh, eventually the Philistines, now here's the point. David has his battle with Goliath. And and King Saul promises, whoever kills Goliath, I'm going to give him my daughter in marriage. So David wins the daughter in marriage. He steps to, to the king, you know, step to the throne. So anyway, uh, but the point was that because people started going, yeah, David's a great guy, Saul got a little angry and then tried to kill him. So David escaped and got away and took off down to the Philistines and became a mercenary for the Philistines. Anyway, the point was eventually they're about to go and invade and fight off Saul and the Philistine and other commanders say, hey, we don't want to have David and his habit root coming along with us. He's a son-in-law of those guys and if they turn on us, they'd be dangerous. Leave him behind. And they do. So anyway, the Philistines go out there and they beat Saul and then Saul dies on a sword or whatever and then he's dead. Now, 
they killed two of his sons, Jonathan and another one. And uh, Jonathan, of course, had been accused of plotting with David. And uh, King Saul even called them, you, uh, you, you son of a, any whatever, dirty name about plotting with the son of Jesse, David, against me. So, but anyway, uh, he's dead too. And only one son survives, Isbal, with Abner as general. So basically, after the rout, you've got Abner and Isbal in this little area of Judah. And you've got David down there who's been put aside by the Philistines in this little area in Israel. And uh, so now, what happens is, Isbal and David cooperate a little bit, fight a little bit over territory, but to try to get their stuff back from the Philistines. Well, eventually, David, well, Abner is killed by Joab, David's general. And then Isbal is killed by some of his own men. So that now there's only David left. One of the two sons of Saul, technically, son and son-in-law. And he becomes king of Israel and Judah. And uh, reigns for another 30, he was seven years in just Israel, then 33 more years as both. Over trade routes, and he's taking control and expanding and expanding. And when he dies, Solomon takes over. And of course now Solomon is at the middle of trade routes. He's got 40 years worth of peace after David's conquests. At interest rates of about 20%, you probably double your money <laughs> every four years. And over 40 years he doubled his gold you know, a thousand times. So that's a lot of gold he ended up with. And that's why King Solomon ended up being the biggest traitor and king and richest man on the planet. Sort of like the house of Rothschild, you know, a hundred years ago. They had all the gold. So, now we're going to read about out of the Bible about King Solomon's gold, his treasures. One. So, this is Solomon's splendor. Uh, the weight of the gold that Solomon received every year was 666 talents. 25 talents to the ton. Get it? So a talent is like a four pence of a ton. 25 talents to the ton. So, 666 tells you how many tons. But that's just what he's getting every year to start. So, uh, also, all the kings of Arabia and the governors of the land brought gold and silver to Solomon. Why? Do they like bringing them their money? I bet you they're paying their loans from the richest man on the planet. When people bring their money to the Rothschilds, is it because they want it or because they owe it? So King Saul probably became creditor to most of the area, like anybody with the gold would have. So King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold. 600 becas of hammered gold went into each shield. So that's two tons per shield, two and a half tons a shield. 300 or 200 of them, that's 480 tons. He also made 300 small shields with 300 becas, another 360 tons. 840 tons of gold shields for decorations. Okay, pretty impressive, right? Um, the king put them in a palace in the forest. Then the king made a great throne and laid with ivory and pure gold. Anyway, gold, 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 gold. All of King Solomon's goblets were gold, and all the household articles were gold, and gold, gold, gold. Anyway, the point is, once every three years his fleet returned carrying gold, silver, and all those riches of the ages. Well, that was collections from the loan shark from around his whole area, right? Every, everybody wanted to borrow good old King Saul's gold. So, King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. And I believe it. All the kings of the earth saw an audience with Solomon to hear his wisdom, and everyone who came brought a gift, articles of gold and silver, money, <laughs> those days. So, um, Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horses. Now, I called them armored person carriers, APCs. And chariots I called tanks, so you get a feeling for it. You know, you've got tanks and armored person carriers, pretty tough stuff. And uh, which he kept in chariot cities and also with him in Jerusalem. He ruled over all the kings from the Euphrates River to the land of the Philistines and as far as Egypt. And the king made silver as common as stones because he had so much gold. So his daily provisions, he had so much. The people of Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They ate, they drank, and they were merry. We'll see. 
And Solomon ruled over the kingdoms from the river to the land of Lebanon. Okay. So during his lifetime, um, each man lived under his own vine and fig tree. You will see. So finally Solomon had 4,000 stalls and Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh and married Pharaoh's daughter. Keep that in mind. Their kin. He was kin with Shishak. What a soap opera. Shishak, the guy who invaded and took Jero for all of Solomon's gold five years after Saul died, was kin with Solomon. Wow! Changes, doesn't it, when you find out Shishak was kin. So anyway, he married Solomon had Pharaoh's daughter. Now, I wonder, you think that uh, he, gave, he gave Pharaoh better rates on his loans? He tries to kill Jeroboam, who they say is a threat to the throne. Jeroboam was like foreman of the workers, and Jeroboam escaped to the protection of Shishak, Pharaoh of Egypt. And then after Solomon died, Jeroboam comes back and leads the revolt against Rehoboam and takes the ten tribes of Israel away. Finally, now that's what happens now. All the gold is gone. It's been plundered by Shishak, who took it all and has become the richest pharaoh on the planet. And then in 800, you have the last story, Jehoahaz, king of Israel. In the 23rd year of Josiah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, king of Israel, gets invaded by the Arameans, the Syrians to the north. So under the power of Hazel, king of Aram. Then Jehoahaz sought the Lord's favor, and the Lord rendered a deliverer for Israel. And they escaped from the power of Aram, and then they continued to live in their homes as before. So that's the only other mention of, a, of you know, them being bullied around. of Egyptian are Shoshan, right? Well, here is Shoshan's route. And you can see he lives, he leaves Egypt and he shoots one gang down into the Negev. And then he shoots up here into Israel and all the way up there, all the way to the top of Israel and all the way back. Okay? That's his campaign. And therefore Shoshan, you say, wow, He's got to be the Shishak. And the second pillar now is Ramses, with the Eber's scroll. Now, I'm going to go into the Battle of Kadesh, because it's important to know this. In the Battle of Kadesh, Seti, his father, had lost to the Hittites. So the Hittites basically own northern Syria. Now, they're threatening Israel and Judah and into Egypt. So, Ramses now goes north and takes on the um, Hittites at Kadesh. And he gets whooped at a stalemate. He falls into a trap, loses a lot of men, but smartly escapes and is saved at the last minute by his last division who show up just on time. And if you go and see ancient mysteries on TV, the Ramses Kadesh story, you can even see here a clear picture as he's shooting all these people on this citadel. Okay? Guy's bending over, you think he's giving up, he's got an arrow in the head, and the lady's got an arrow in the head. So anyway, this is the guy on his chariot over here shooting all these people at the Battle of Kadesh. Big man, Ramses. So, here's the point. He loses Kadesh, and that means that he is going to possibly lose Israel and Judea because if he doesn't do something about them, he's going to have a problem. So, now, he got beat off. This was year five of Ramses' reign, the battle in Kadesh. He went there with 20,000 men and 6,000 horses and they say 500 chariots. Now, okay, that makes sense, but and took a whopper. So let's say he comes back with half the force, okay? And, uh, but then again, so now he's in danger of losing Israel and Judah as well. So in year eight, he goes back and he at least grabs Judah and he invades and he takes Jerusalem on because it says in year eight, Ramses the king 
took Shalem. Well, Shalem, what's Shalem? Well, in Genesis, the Melchizedek, king of Salem. And in Psalms, his tent is in Salem, his dwelling place in Zion. And finally, there's another one in Hebrews where they talk about the king of Salem means king of peace. Now, when they say Salem, Jews say Shalem. And when Arabs say Salam, Jews say Shalom. And when we say Jesus, they say Yeshua with a sh instead of a su. So, just because they put an S in here, the king of Salem on Zion, it really is Shalem to the Israelites. So, Ramses went and invaded and he took Shalem. And they, you know, there's proof that he said it. So anyway, now, finally, that was in his year eight. And those are the three pillars of time. Thebes, Shoshank, and Ramses. And in five years in, Ramses does his thing. And in eight years in, he goes and he takes little Judah. I don't know how many chariots he had left after being decimated three years before with his 20,000 man army, but it was enough to take Judah back, okay? So, now, here are the problems with that. If you go look here, it's, this is it. This is called the Middle Bronze Age during the Hyksos period. And then with Amos starts the Late Bronze One. And then with Akhenaten starts the Late Bronze Two. And with Ramses starts the Late Bronze Three eras. So all of the Late Bronze era are New Kingdom. And after Ramses it's the Iron Age, the Blue, okay? So Iron Age to Ramses, and then um, Bronze Age to the New Kingdom, and then Middle Bronze Age earlier than that. So, now, they went digging for Solomon in the Iron Age strata, and they found no temples. They found nothing. He was supposed to build a Ge Gezer and Megiddo and different cities, big, big forts, nothing. But they said, you know something? We noticed a whole bunch of big buildings 300 years earlier during Judges. We don't know how they got there. No one ever mentioned them. What's a big castle doing in Jerusalem and Judges when they were just a bunch of hillbillies? Now they also said, oh, get this. They say, you know, we're looking at these Armano letters and they're talking about these happy roofs these outlaws in Judah and Israel. And it sounds just like David's happy ruse 300 years later. Gee, I wonder why. Well, guess what? They got this block out of place. And that's why nothing matches. And David Roll found out where to put it in place. So you can't find it in the archaeological record. Oh, by the way, here's a list of all the cities that were done by Shoshin. But, here we go. Now, let me show you another reason why there's a screw up with that. Notice here that if Ramses is in 1280 when he starts, that puts Amos fighting for the liberation from the invaders in 1540, right in the middle of the sojourn. When they're living gently with the Pharaoh, the rich Pharaoh, in a stable kingdom for 200 years. Are we supposed to believe Joseph came down during the Hyksos period and then got beaten off by Amos and they didn't mention it? So, there's proof that there's no way Amos could have been beaten off the Hyksos in 1540. And Egyptian Texts do say they were smitten by a blast from God and then invaded by the foreign the, uh, Hyksos. So that means that you got to move Amos down here past Moses and you got to throw in another 100 or 200 years for the Hyksos, 14th, 15th, 16th, and 17th dynasties in there. They were shrunk and squeezed together, okay? Well, you have to move them up two, three hundred years. So that's going to push everybody up three hundred years for sure.
because Amos is going to come after Exodus. So, the whole block moves up. That means Shoshank can't be Shishak. He's pushed out of the position. And some other pharaoh became richest pharaoh on the planet. Now, how can we show that Shoshank's a screw up? Well, if you look at the Shoshank literature, his route, you'll see that all the cities he invaded were in northern Israel. He didn't invade any of Judah's cities. And yet Shishak invaded Judah's cities and certainly didn't invade his ally, Jeroboam's cities in Israel. So Shoshank couldn't have been the guy who invaded Judah. And here's the map. You can see it goes to the north of Judah and all through Israel and back, but it doesn't go into Judah. And now it's the problem. So I'm going to read what they say from Shishak in the thing. <laughs> okay, it says, now, one guy, one professor folks said, there's complete harmony between the Bible, Shishak's inscription and the Bible record. And Bimson, Professor Bimson said, this ain't true. If you look at the routes, they're completely different. He didn't go near Judah, and he went straight only into Israel. And another guy wrote, the main problem identifying Shishak as Shoshank seems to center around the issue of the invasion route. The biblical account describes an invasion of Palestine's southern kingdom, as this region was an enemy of Jeroboam's northern kingdom. An invasion of this area by Egypt would be consistent with the firmly established Jeroboam-Shishak alliance. In the Egyptian account of King Shoshank's invasion, however, Rehoboam's southern kingdom is largely bypassed with the Egyptian forces and the assault mainly on the north. So who can say that this was on Jeroboam? And then finally, they said, on his wall at Karnak, they have a list of all these cities and none from, Jew, I mean from Judah and no Jerusalem. Now, the guy says, we well, find it hard to believe he could have dropped his biggest prize, right? Could Shishak have not mentioned the biggest gold heist in history, what made him the richest pharaoh on the planet? Forgot to put it down on the list. It ain't Shoshak. And finally, according, oh yeah, that's another part. And, and that's later. Okay, so basically, if Shoshank was Shishak, he would have attacked Judah. And he did, so he can't be. So who is the pharaoh who became the richest pharaoh on the planet? Well, we have to now go to the Armana letters. Okay, the Armana letters. They found these clay tablets in Armana from the flower child pharaoh who lost all his colonies because he was too busy doing stuff to keep up with the state. These are what the clay tablets say. And I'm going to read some to you, and let's see if you can figure out who they're talking about. Labayu is identified in the letters from Saul at writing a letter to the king, the pharaoh, and saying, hey, these guys took my town and I just took it back. So how come they're bad-mouthing me? I'm not coming to your court and I'm keeping my town. Now, what does that sound like? So, next. Okay, now remember, this is Pharaoh getting mail from. Now, the relationship between the two Israelite factions, and that's of course Judah and Israel, difficult to flip. Sometimes they allies, sometimes they fight, they're trying to get control from the Philistines. Hence, there's a letter from a guy named Baku to the guy, EA250 is the name of the clay tablet, that says, hey, the sons of Laba, the sons of Labayu, now they're talking about the sons of Labayu. And a guy is writing, he says, they wrote me this letter. Why have you handed Gath, and that's a city of Saul, to the king, your lord, a city which Labayu, our father, had taken, wage war against the people of Gina for having killed our father. Actually, when he was on Mount Gilboa, Saul was betrayed by the people of Gina, which let the Philistines take him. And so they're, they're angry, and they're saying, go punish those people of Gina, and why'd you, let, why'd you give the city back to the king, to the pharaoh? So, another communication between Akhenaten, talking about the death of Labayu, 
And this is E8290, where he says, oh no, not yet. Yeah, that's right there. Anyway, they killed Labayu. Now, we got a letter here from Abadiah, the ruler of Jerusalem, to Pharaoh in the Armana era. Talking about the Habiru who are attacking. And the, and the historians are going, wow, that sounds like David's Habiru's of 300 years later. Because they think it's up here. Okay. So, here is a deed against the land, which Milkayu and Shwarada did against the land of the king. From Gezer, he says, they have taken troops from there. They seized Rubate. The land of the king has deserted to the Habiru. So the guy from Gath, which is in Israel, and Judah, is writing and saying, everybody's switching over to the Habirus. But they don't mention David in particular. And again, in a follow-up letter, he says, this is the deed of them and the sons of Labayu. Together they're doing this. So you mention Labayu and the sons of Labayu all the time as they're taking over Judah and Jerusalem. So, meanwhile, back in Jerusalem, his letters are getting desperate because the, David is now moving closer. And he's saying, may the king give thought to this land. The land uh, of the king is lost. All of it has attacked me. I am myself treated like a Habiru. But now the Habiru have taken the very cities of the king. Not a single ruler remains of the king, my lord. All are lost. Behold. This one's gone. This one's gone. You did nothing. This one's gone. Again, the king did nothing. Please, come and get us. Get us out of here before the happy will kill us. Nine, and that was E8288. So the pitiful plea for rescue, well, anyway, he gets taken over, and then David finishes him off. So now a new enemy from the mountains. Now the king of Gath, or Gezer, and he starts writing about the guys that are from the north. And he's saying, may the king, my lord, know that the war against me and Shredana is severe. So may the king, my lord, save his land from the power of the Habiru. They never mentioned the ruler of the Habiru, though. Otherwise, may the king, my lord, send chariots to save us or they're going to kill us. So this unhappy state of affairs forces them to go take on David. And they all go up to this place. And sure enough, the place they go to in the EA letter um, is the same one mentioned by David in the Bible. It's called, uh, anyway, and then finally, E8292, there being war against me from the mountains, I built a house, fortress, its name Manhattu, and Manhattu is where David records his first defeat of the Philistines. <coughs> is it coming together that our mana letters are describing what we know? The first battle is followed by another, and then finally, the last letter, well, that's Samuel, where they talk about the pass of Gezer. And finally, the Habiru are virtually at the gates of Gezer. Urgent letters are flying back and forth. And he says, I have the order with the king, and I will safety Gezer. And Gezer doesn't fall to the Israelites. It's taken later by a pharaoh who gives it to Solomon as a dowry with the daughter. That's what happened. So, do the Armana letters specifically identify the rebel city? Well, the answer is in E8298 from Yapuha, presumably the next ruler of Gezer. He says, may the king, my lord, be informed that my younger brother, having become my enemy, entered Mikas and pledged himself to the Habiru. As Tiana is at war with me, take thought for your land. Tiana, what's Tiana? Oh, Jews sometimes say Tiana, Tsa, and that's Zion. So, they're talking about Habiru occupying Zion. Tiana is how they called the word to the Pharaoh in those days. So, on the many rulers who complain to Pharaoh that the Habiru are too powerful, you have him in 284 and Shwardana in 306, also mention the city of Tiana as their enemy. So, three guys mention their enemy is Tiana. That's where the ruler is running the Habiru out of. So, what can we make of the name Tiana? He goes into the Tzu, says it must be Zion. Now, finally, finally, this is the best one of all. EA 256 is a letter written by a guy named Mutball. A little bit like Istball. And Mutball is writing to Pharaoh. Now, remember, Joseph is Joseph. Jesus is Yeshua in Jewish. 
Jesse is Yesse. Joab is Yoab. So when you see a J, it's really a Y. Okay? So, he says, this is a letter from Mutball, which he presumes is this ball, talking about. And he's saying, ah, uh, he's saying, uh, blah, blah, today, oh, my Lord, you know, this is the message of Mutball, your servant. I fall on my feet. How can it be said in your presence, Mutball has fled? He's hidden. Ayab. Ayab. Yoab. Yoab was David's general. How can the king of Pella flee from the commissioner? I'm not running. As the king, my lord, lives. As the king lives. I swear, ya Yaab, or Ayab, is not in Pella. In fact, he's been in the field on campaign for two months. Just ask Benenina and ask Dajua and ask Yeshuya. Now, Benina, well, Benina was in many Bible stories David's and that's Solomon's executioner. Anybody needed killing, Benina did it. And Dajua is who you think it is. And Yeshuya is Jesse, Yesi, the father. So he said, I'm not hiding David's general. Just ask David, David's father, and the executioner. They'll tell you I ain't hiding them. And that's a letter to Pharaoh with those names in it. Now, last but not least, here's a list of all the cities that are listed in the Armada letters and the cities that are listed in Samuel in the Bible. And they're all alive at the same time together. Need it. So, I hope I've convinced you that there's no way that, well, now we've identified which Pharaoh lived with David, right? So now all we got to do is add 80 years from 1015 to get down, or 90 years actually, to get down to 925 and see who was the Pharaoh. And this is in Akhenaten's day when it's the new kingdom and we got those numbers. So who was the Pharaoh in 925? Ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. This is the new David Roll timeline. Moves Amos up to here. Moves Akhenaten up to Saul and David. And it moves Ramses up to Rehoboam and Shishak. Ramses! Ramses! The guy who got what? With a lousy 20,000 guys? In year five? And then he comes back at Judah three years later with 60,000 cavalry? A couple of hundred thousand infantry? 1,200 chariots? Come on, give me a break. How could he have come up with 20 times the army in only three years. That's the only thing arguing against Ramsey because there's some good proof he did it. This is Professor Kitchen who studied the walls at Karnak. And you got the wall in Kadesh and you got this other one where he says the town which the king plundered, plundered, notice the word, the plunder's gotta be something to take, right? It ain't just like burning a little village to the ground. He plundered it, means there was stuff to take. It was Shalem. So, it was Ramsey. So here we go. Professor Kitchen, having made a detailed study of the reliefs of Ramsey's tomb at the Rasmus Rams Museum, confirms he went up to Jerusalem. Yeah, we know that. He had to, right? Next spring in year 70, Ramses took things in the hand and no time he reached Gaza. And then, you know, I'll show you his map. Notice, Ramses doesn't shoot up here and go north. He does a pincer around Judah. Okay? So, uh, the, a column swept down south, east, and pushed these guys out, and struck another one through the negative desert, a third one down here. And then Ramses himself took off over the top, <coughs> clockwise, to complete the pincer movement. And over the Jordan, and then to link up with the prince below. So, Kitchen is determined from the year 8 campaign reliefs that Ramses entered the central hill country of Judah 
and reached Jerusalem. Now, if he did that in the day of Solomon, he was going to have to take on 1,400 chariots and 12,000 armored person carriers, plus the whole nation of Israel while Solomon was there. Oh, boy, after Jeroboam, 10 tribes were gone. Solomon lost all his infantry. Now he's left with nothing but tanks and APCs, but no infantry. But still, considered to, you know, what, you know, he came back from Iraq, Kadesh, with a couple of hundred tanks and, you know, who knows, two, three thousand chariots, I mean, APCs and five thousand men. How strong could, how could he end up with 60,000 horses and hundreds of thousands of warriors in three years to do this, to take on King Solomon's security? How could he do that? It's called Absalom's Conspiracy. And this was the son of David, who provided himself with a chariot, one chariot, 50 guys, and he'd go stand at the gates and say, are you getting any justice out of my father? If I was the king, I'd give you justice. And he won over all the hearts of Israel to a point that David had to escape. That sort of means that David wasn't particularly treating everybody fair, right? If his head son could foment a rebellion. But anyway, uh, eventually he orders that uh, Benina go kill him, and um, he does. So, another one, Sheba, rebels against David. Now, now a troublemaker named Sheba, son of Bikri, happened to be there. He sounded the trumpet and shouted. Notice these words, they recur again. We have no share in David, no part in Jesse's son, every man to his tent, O Israel. So all the men of Israel deserted David to follow Sheba. And then eventually David had uh, Joab go kill Sheba and get rid of that trouble. So uh, now, he said Sheba's going to cause us more trouble than Absalom. Go kill him. He did. Finally, Solomon's adversaries. Then the Lord raised up against Solomon the adversary, Hadad the Edomite, from the royal line of Edom. Joab had gone and killed everybody there, but he'd escaped and gone to the protection of the Pharaoh in Egypt. Wow. Pharaoh's providing protection to Solomon's enemies? To step uncle's enemies? Member of the family? What kind of soap opera is this? Step a father or step uncle tries to kill this guy and you now put him up? Ooh, right? And finally, Jeroboam. Also, Jeroboam rebel, rebelled against the king. He was one of Solomon's officials, an Ephraimite. And here's the account of how he rebelled against the king. Solomon had built the supporting terraces. Now, in the first 20 years, he built the temple and the palace. And in the second 20 years, he built himself a patio on a hill. Can you imagine all the work to build a patio on a hill? So anyway, and uh, to fill the gap. Now Jeroboam was a man of standing, and when Solomon saw how he did his work, put him in charge of the whole labor force. He was foreman of workers. About the time Jeroboam was going out of Jerusalem, Ahijah, the prophet of Shiloh, said to Jerusalem, because Solomon's screwing around with all these women, God's going to strip out ten tribes from them and give them to you. And so Jeroboam then goes back and starts planning to be king eventually. And he'll hand in those ten tribes. Now it says in the Wikipedia about Jeroboam. Jeroboam is the guy who got kicked out. And then his name means the people's contend. Or he pleads the people's cause. Which he did. He was basically the union foreman, right? So, and get this. He married an Egyptian princess. Wow, Jeroboam escaped to Shishak, plus married an Egyptian princess. He's kin to and closer to the Shishak than Solomon is. So, now, Israel rebels against Rehoboam. Now, this is the important one. Rehoboam went to Sheshem in Israel, for all the Israelites had gone there to make him king. When, Re when Jeroboam heard this, he was still in Egypt, where he had fled from King Solomon. He returned from Egypt. So they sent for Jeroboam, and he and the whole assembly of Israel went to Rehoboam and said to him, 
Your father put a heavy yoke on us. But now, lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. Harsh labor and a heavy yoke. Now, harsh labor is basically taxes. That's how people paid their taxes in the old days. But what's a yoke? What's a heavy yoke? In biblical parliaments, the yoke of oppression, the chain of oppression is interest on your debts that grow so you can't pay them forever. So they're saying, give us a break on taxes and give us a break on our loans and we'll let you be king. Solomon put us under a heavy yoke, high interest rates, need a lot of gold shields and gold doorknobs. And he gave us a lot of harsh labor. Wanted us to build this patio on a hill, you know. We want, we don't want to work so much for a patio on a hill. So anyway, Rio Bowl match it, go away, come back in three days. So he asked the elders, what should I do? And they said, if today you'll be servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. But Rehoboam rejected the advice that the elders gave him and consulted the young men who'd grown up with him and were serving with him, like the generals and the bankers. And they said, oh, so then three days later, General Baum and all the people returned to Rehoboam and he said, okay, the king answered the people harshly, rejected the advice given to him by the elders, he followed the advice of the young man and said, my father made your yoke heavy, I will make it even heavier. I'm raising the interest rate two points. My father scourged you with whips and lashes, I will scourge you with scorpions and make you work. After all, I got all the tanks and all the APCs. You're just a bunch of workers. So the king did not listen to the people. For this turn of events, the Lord to fulfill the word, he spoke to him. And when all Israel saw that the king refused to listen, they answered to the king, What share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son? To your tents, O Israel. And last line, look after your own house, O David. Same line as Sheba. So Sheba was complaining against David's loan sharking and taxes too and not getting a cut of the good life. So the Israelites went home. But as for the Israelites who were living in the towns of Judah, Rehoboam still ruled over them. King Rehoboam sent out Adoniram, who was in charge of forced labor. But all Israel stoned them to death. Yay! Don't like tax collectors that much. King Rehoboam managed to escape, and so Israel's been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. <coughs> so, finally, Rehoboam wanted to take his APCs and his tanks and go and subjugate Israel. But the prophet Shemaiah said, Sorry, go home, everybody. You know, they obeyed him. He said, You're not going to go kill your kin. Go home. And they did. Now, Rehoboam fortifies Judah. Rehoboam lived in Jerusalem and built up towers for defense in Judah. Bethlehem, Etam, Tekoa, Benzer, da, 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 all towns to the south between Jerusalem and Egypt, not to the north. So, um, and then he put many defenses, strengthened them, gave them lots of food and oil, made them very strong, so Judah and Benjamin were his. Rehoboam appointed him, dispersing his sons throughout the districts to be the rulers and run the show. You know, that's what you call family affair. So, Shishak attacks Jerusalem. After Rehoboam's position as king was established, and he becomes strong, he and all of Israel abandoned the law and they've been faithful to God. Shishak, king of, of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem in the fifth year with 1,200 chariots and 60,000 horsemen and innumerable troops of Libyans, Sukites, and Cushites. And of course, that's the Nubians and the Libyans and others. That came from Egypt and he captured the fortified 
cities of Judah and came up as far as Jerusalem. Now that's in the Bible. And that matches what Professor Kitchen said that Ramses did in year eight. In year eight. So when the Lord saw how they'd humble themselves, he said, okay, I'm not going to let Shishak kill them all. So Shishak came, he carried off all the treasure of the temple of the Lord and the treasure of the royal palace. He took everything, including the gold shield Solomon made, and he was left with only bronze shields. So, we have the good chance that we have the um, Shishak, who was actually Ramses. Now, why would this happen? Can you imagine how he must have really made Solomon angry, protecting Ben-Hadad, and then protecting um, Jeroboam, who was a threat to Rehoboam? So anyway, five, no, five years after, the, sorry, three years after his death, no, two years after Solomon's death, is the fifth year of Ramses, when Ramses goes up north to fight off the Hittites who are invading Israel, right? What's he doing going up there if he's not going to defend his ally Jeroboam in Israel? And he comes up with a point and he says, you know that last division that came around from behind in that other route to save the day? He said, they were called the Nerean. And wouldn't that be neat if those were Jeroboam's troops? Because who here thinks that Ramses went and took on the Hittites to protect Israel without asking Israel to chip in? And if you were Jeroboam and your friend your guy had been, you know, helped you, is gonna go fight for you, would you not want her to go with him? So good chance Jeroboam was in on that, and there's a chance that last division, the Nirin, were the ones who might have seen Ramses, which might explain why he gave a princess to Uncle Jeroboam. Now, I think Jeroboam was older than Ramses, because I gotta now explain why I think he did this. I think he did this, now I'm going off into my conjecture. Ramses grew up in the era when step-uncle Saul was the richest man in the world. Do you think little Rami ever went and spent a couple of summers visiting Auntie and Uncle Saul? And having his interest in architecture and monuments, is there any chance he ran up against Gerald Ball, construction foreman, who had built the Milo? Maybe too, which might explain why he would have protected Gerald, and Gerald would have run there. But Gerald would have been older than Ramses, and Ramses would have probably looked up to Gerald, the construction foreman who built the Milo, right? So, there's a good chance he said it was his daughter, it might have been the sister-in-law. Well, I bet it was an older princess, not a daughter, because Ramses is younger than Jero, right? But still, Jero married Ramses' daughter. So here's the point, or kid. So here's the point. When they say that Shishak, Shoshak, attacked Israel, was he really attacking his daughter's husband? Does that make any sense to anybody? No, it can't be. It has to be that it was Ramses without Judah. So, getting to the last point now, yeah, he can lose Levant. Here's what happens. If the Hittites come back and they take out Jeroboam and Israel, Ramses will have to go back and defend again. He got them all last time. And in the meantime, you got Rehoboam building forts between there. Now, if the Hittites take Jero and Israel, you know Reho is going to join the Hittites against Ramses. And Ramses knows it too. So how did Ramses get 20 times the army organized? He started this reign facing the Nubians in the south and the Libyans in the west and the Hittites in the north. How did he come up with a huge army to be Hishak? Here's how. Follow the money. Now, Ramses comes up to the king of Nubia and he says, look it, we've been raiding each other for centuries. 
You steal my towns, I steal your towns. You steal my people, sell them for slaves. I steal your people, sell them for slaves. So we can pay King Saul our debts. How much you owe King Saul? Hundred talents, you know, hundred, you know, thousand talents? Okay. Well, well, what's your rate? Eighteen percent. I'm getting it for ten. Can you imagine how Ramses might have chafed at having to pay debt service to Saul, let alone Rio? So, Ramses goes up to the king of Libya and says, Tell you what, you two, you're in debt to the neck and you're paying the loan sharks over in Zion. What we're going to do is, why don't we? I got Jeroboam to split off the ten tribes of the Israeli infantry. And all Rio has got left to guard the gold is his 1,400 tanks and his 12,000 horses. Now, I've only got three or 400 tanks myself after my beating three years ago, and I've only got maybe three, 4,000 horses, but I know you guys got lots. Here's the point. Here's the deal. If you guys come and help me pull off the biggest gold heist in history, you can bust up all your markers that you owe King Saul and you get a share of the gold and a share of our enemy's markers because we'll keep collecting. So, is that me? Is that a gun? Push down. Anyway, so that was the deal Ramses could have made to the Libyans and the Sukites and the Nubians, and simply said, and even, you know, Jeroboam didn't get involved in this one, and simply said, hey, we're all in debt to this lousy stinker Rio, son of the worst stinker Solomon, you know, the greediest man on the planet, and all that gold sitting there with no infantry. Let's go get it. And I think that's how Ramses could have pulled off a coalition that could have said, hey, if I announce remission of your debts if you go on this crusade, plus a share in the gold, I would have ended up with 30,000 Egyptian horses, let alone you guys. So maybe Ramses and the Libyans and the Nubians all came together as the Bible said because it was the biggest gold heist in history. And they pulled it off. And it was so big, they took all the fortified towns of Judah, not mentioned in Shoshank. Now, so that's how I think Ramses could have pulled off, talking them into going from his little 10,000-man army after Kadesh to a 60,000, 60, 3,000 horses left to 60,000 horses and hundreds of thousands of men. In three years, he did it, and he became the richest pharaoh in the world. Last statement on King Shoshank. So what the hell was King Shoshank doing with his raid up into Israel? Shoshank was the deliverer of the Israelites from the Aramean Syrians who'd taken them over. Who else but someone from the south is going to go free them from captors from the north? Therefore, the campaign of Shoshank into Israel, avoiding Judah to go and save all of his buddies and take back his realm, makes a lot of sense. So Shoshank was actually the deliverer in 800 of Jehoaz. Ramses was Shishak. And that is what David ruled, and they called his thing French. So now I am going to contact the bookmaker, William Hill in Britain, and I'm going to say I want to bet on David Roll's fringe theory that Ramses is Shishak, and that block is 350 years out of sync with reality. Now, if you believe that my letters from Akhenaten were talking about David and Saul, well then, you've got to believe that Ramses could be the only pharaoh, and yet we know three years before he'd been busted. How could he have gone to the omnipowerful Shishak in only three years to be able to take on King Solomon's security and all those tanks? 
one way. Right throughout history, the debtors always arise and overthrow the creditors, and Ramses was the pharaoh who led the debtors out of debt to King Solomon. Cool. Yeah. Okay.